Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We are recording today from various locations around Winnipeg, all within Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota, as well as the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heart of the Métis homeland. Our drinking water comes from Shoal Lake 41st Nation in Treaty 3 territory. In this episode, we will be discussing The Huntress by Kate Quinn. I'm Dennis from the Idea Mill, though I'm currently found at the Henderson Library, and I am neither a lake witch, nor a sky witch, nor a night witch, but more of a sandwich. <laughs> Oh, Across Janice. the screen for me is... <laughs> Hi, I'm Kirsten, and I am the librarian at the Harvey Smith Library, and I am your Taga Hexa for today, your Day Witch. <laughs> <laughs> and across the screen from me is... Uh, hi, comrades. I am <laughs> Comrade Trevor, branch head of the Louis Rail Library, and I guess I am the Library Witch. Mm. A good book can carry me away from an ever ancient ordinary day. Yeah. So keep it down, leave me alone. Close the doors and turn off the phone. Cause all I ever really need is a little more time to read. And you, dear readers, we couldn't do this without you. Let us know what you think of the books we're reading. You can find our email address and all of our social media outlets by going to wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca and scrolling to the bottom of the page. If you hang around until the end of the episode, you can enjoy our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. In a moment, Trevor will give us a summary of the book, but first, Kirsten will tell us a bit about the author. Okay, Kate Quinn is a native of Southern California. She attended Boston University, where she earned a bachelor's and master's degree in classical voice. But at the same time, as she was doing those studies, she was writing her first novel, Mistress of Rome. And since then, she has written four novels in this Empress of Rome saga, uh, as well as two books in the Italian Renaissance, and then turned to the 20th century with uh, her latest uh, novels, which includes The Huntress. Kate and her husband now live in San Diego with three rescue dogs. Her love of history was inspired by her mother, a librarian. How many, how many times do we, do we talk about a parent of a writer being a librarian? I think quite often in this podcast. So anyway, her mother, of course, was a librarian and a history scholar with a degree in ancient and medieval history. And of course, uh, she told Kate Quinn bedtime stories about Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. So Kate says when she started telling stories of her own, it was, of course, very natural to gravitate towards the past. As a young writer, she also relied on her mother's um, editorial skills um, for any critique of her writing. And that's something that she continues to do today. She relies on her mother for those editorial skills. Her father was a jazz musician, and she says that when he wasn't actively occupied by doing something else, music was his default mode. And she talks about this because she also describes herself as a writer like that. Writing is her default mode. That is what she does when she's not doing anything else. She started putting word to paper at seven years old, and that was when she decided she was a writer. She wanted to live vicariously through someone, through a character that was able to do all the things that she couldn't. So own a horse, live alone in medieval Ireland, for instance. Uh, She describes her writing style as historical fiction with an irreverent twist. She says she tries to incorporate humor in a lot of what she writes. And she says that she's really fascinated by the aftermaths of a historical event. So not just what happens, but what happens afterwards. And we certainly see that in the, in the Huntress. Um, her method of, of writing, as one would guess, with historical fiction is equally as much research as it is writing and editing. Her website is great. So I would encourage everyone to just take a look because 
Uh, she it's very uh, full of lots of information and she has a blog and she's obviously a voracious reader herself and obviously the daughter of a librarian because she has lists of books of books that she has read with little synopsis and also suggestions of who might like this book so a little re- readers advisory um on her on her website about her own books but about lots of of books as well that she loves so that is Kate Quinn who would be super interesting to invite over for dinner. So come on over, Kate. (laughs) That's nice. As you're reading that, I was thinking my default mode is napping. (laughs) (laughs) Are you guys ready for the summary? Yeah, bring it. All right. I've been accused myself of doing kind of over detailed summaries. So I've gone the other way. Okay. What do you think of this? (laughs) Set in the years immediately following World War II, and with a large number of flashbacks to the war itself, the Huntress tells the story of a ruthless Nazi murderess who escapes to the United States in the wake of the war, and the individuals, including Nina, an ex-Soviet bomber pilot, Jordan, a young aspiring photographer, Ian, an English war correspondent turned Nazi hunter, and Tony, a former soldier and Ian's assistant, who take it upon themselves to bring her to justice. That's a very good summary. Succinct. <sighs> Succinct and informative. I had help with the internets. Ah, mm-hmm. and it's not—it's not—it's not taken verbatim, but I, 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 a little from column A, a little from column B, and a little of magic that I threw in myself. <laughs> it's the magic that makes all the difference, Trevor. Yeah. The library witch was at work. Right, we'll start as usual. How did you guys find the book? I liked it. I actually enjoy a World War II historical fiction. I have to say, I sometimes think, oh, am I done? Am I done with World War II fiction about soldiers and lovers and uh, spies? But I'm never done with it. I, I, I enjoy it. So I enjoyed this one as well. And I did also read it while I was, you know, at the cottage. So that's, that's also just a great time to read a sort of an involved story like this, I think, because you can certainly just um, seep yourself into it. You know, when I knew nothing about the book, I just saw the title. I was a little worried because I thought it was going to be like a vampire werewolf romance. <laughs> because, <laughs> but I was delighted to see that there were no vampires uh, or werewolves, but there were witches. And yeah, I, I agree with you. Kirsten. I, we think World War II, we would have read enough about it and its aftermath, but it just seems like uh, authors are are still mining that time period and they're able to find stories to tell within it and fascinating things and little parts of the war, unsung heroes like the night witches, which I had to look up afterwards and mm-hmm. were amazed by these flimsy little sh- planes that they're flying made out of canvas and chewing gum. And, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, so, yeah, there's those parts of the, uh, that make you want to read more about the reality. But then, of course, you're drawn into the characters. I thought it was a very well character driven story, as well as feeling like a bit of a taut uh, thriller, too. And a little bit of is she or isn't she and back and mm-hmm. forth. And, you know, oh, you know, uh, oh, no, I, you know, it can't be. And oh, my gosh, what's going to happen here? And all those kinds of feelings. So I, I have to say, yes. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a quick read for me, and I think I'll I'll read some more from her, for sure. Well, th- this will provide good contrast for the episode, because I have to admit, I really didn't enjoy this book. Oh. Um, and for me, it was uh, there were elements I liked, and I think the author clearly does a lot of research and put a lot of effort into writing. She was very strong on things like characterizations. You never had to wonder which character was which. They were all clearly defined. But I found her writing style very heavy-handed, and um, I felt like she beat a lot of her themes to death. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know... It's like, oh, I've forgotten what Nina is afraid of. I wonder (laughs) if she will remind me within the next 20 pages... Over and over and over and over and how every feminine related water spirit that she can think of is uh, a lake witch. And oh, and all the lakes are named after lake witches too. And uh, oh, wow, this is like really. (laughs) So, so I struggled with this book and I had to really work hard to finish it. So, uh, yeah, we, we can discuss that kind of thing as we go (laughs) along. Yeah, well, I, I usually enjoy most of the books we read, but I, I 
just, I don't know. I felt meh the whole time. Like I, I never really got into any of the characters. Do you, do you think possibly Dennis, I'm not putting words in your mouth. Do you think possibly it was because you felt, uh, under the gun to finish that took away some of the enjoyment, like it, because you felt like, Oh, I have this deadline, you know, and I have to read this, read this, read this. And then you were feeling resentful towards the book for reasons, maybe unrelated to the book or, or maybe not. I'm just throwing that out there is, could that have been a part well, of it? I, I don't think so. Uh, the, the reason I was under the gun at the end to read it is because, uh, I couldn't get into it earlier and I mm. struggled to read long stretches of it because I just, yeah, I was not getting into it. Uh, and I actually did enjoy the last part of the read more than the first part. So maybe I should have tried to read it all in one long stretch. I don't know. Yeah, I've, I've just found her writing heavy handed and kind of obvious. Like more than halfway through the book, I knew that the final confrontation was going to involve Nina confronting her fear of drowning in the lake and that, uh, it was going to be at a lake and, <laughs> yeah. you know, Ian was going to have to make sure he didn't uh, kill her because that's his thing. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not, not going to step over that line. And it, it felt to me like, like she's a, a competent author who, and there are, I used to want to be an author, uh, before I realized I just don't have the patience for it. And I've read a lot of books on how to write a book. And it feels to me like she's read those books too, and she's gone through all the outlining, and she's gone through and checked her themes, and she has a huge checklist of things, and she checked them all off. Yeah. But that's how it felt to me, like everything was checked off, and she just made sure she had all of this stuff. It may also be because uh, she puts in a ton of details, and I am not a fan of things that are overly ornate, whether they are mm. art or music or uh, or writing. I found if it's overly ornate, you get lost in the details. Like, you know how in the book, uh, Jordan, as a photographer, her photo essay that she's working on is uh, like working in Boston. And as a way of doing it, she frames it really tight on the essential elements of each worker, like their hands or their the propeller of the plane or the, you know, things like that. Because that locks out all the extraneous details so you can focus on what's important. And uh, I, I wish that she had done that with the writing. <laughs> well, and it was a long book, too. So if you weren't mm. really into it, then you'd be like, oh, my gosh, I still have 200 pages to do. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's interesting that you say that you, you know, like the, the end of the book a bit more. I mean, for me, it didn't, I didn't really care what happened at the end. I didn't actually care if the Nazi hunters hunted and, and found the Jaeger and like, I didn't, that didn't really matter to me. I just found, I, f and, and there were definitely, cause she has so many different characters and each chapter was a different character and a different time frame. So there were three different time frames, I think. And then the, the different characters related to that. And I mean, and I did find the whole story about the Nachthexen to be the most interesting for sure. Um, and she could have almost done just a book just about that, you know, rather mm -hmm. than bringing in then the Nazi hunters and, um, Jordan and women during the war and, um, or during the, you know, the, the thirties and forties and how they were treated and how they were expected to marry. You're right. There was like a lot packed into this book. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, um, I, I didn't mind that because then it just, that actually is what kind of drew me in. And I was able, like I said before, to immerse myself into it rather than just take it at little bits at a time. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm usually not a big fan of stories that have different timelines that are interspersed and stuff. I, I like my stories straight ahead, you know, but <laughs> in this case, I'm a, it, it, that part didn't bother me. Although it was interesting to me that Nina, who I feel is the most interesting character in the book. Yeah, for uh, sure. I mean, we could argue about who's the main character. It feels more of an ensemble piece, but really, I cared mostly about Nina. But uh, the weird thing about it is, you know, in the flashback parts, it's in her voice. And yet in the current day, or not the current day, but in the Ian timeline, uh, it's told from his perspective. And I felt like her characterization in that felt very different mm -hmm. than the characterization 
almost like they were not the same characters. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I felt that her older self, her post-war self, if you will, was almost a, like a caricature that was used for jokes, you know, where she would talk in this heavy Russian accent and, and she was ready with her switchblade. And she was, uh, you know, I, I was laughing at what she was saying just because I, I can just imagine her talking that way. I thought she's a fantastic character. I want to see more of her. I would love if there was a series just with Nina going around, you know, kicking butt. Uh, but then you go back to this, you know, her storyline becoming a pilot or growing up with her father. Uh, and uh, to me, I, I had a hard time reconciling those two characters, even up to the end where to the end of the flashback sequence, where, of course, she has her encounter with the Huntress and Ian's brother and stuff. And uh, I just I didn't see I didn't see any through lines from those two storylines, which I thought you would eventually I didn't, I didn't pick up any. I don't know if you guys did. But maybe I'm aside from her fear of the water. Yeah, but yeah. maybe you know, um, you know, when we first m- meet her through Ian's eyes, he doesn't really know her, right? right? And I do think that she becomes sort of a fuller character as he really does get to know her, and she becomes much more sort of multi-dimensional and less of a caricature, like you said, because, I mean, he really didn't know her at all. And yeah, because I, you're right, because at the beginning, I was like, are these, are they even the same? Is Nina, is this like a different person who's taken on the I, role of Nina? Because right, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was so mixed up at the beginning. Oh, I, the, I thought that those early Nina chapters may have even been the origin of the Huntress. That's what I thought well, too. Like yeah. I was like, oh, is she gonna yeah. somehow like? Yeah. But I was like, no, no. But yeah, I, I, you're right. I wasn't. I wasn't entirely sure what was going on in those early early yeah. pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you guys had that experience with her character seeming different because that's one thing I found consistent. She's seemed like the same character to me throughout, uh, just seen from different perspectives. And at different times, of mm. course. But uh, I don't know. That that part felt consistent to me. Hmm. All right, then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is how this one's going to be. All right. Everything yeah. that we <laughs> Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to be the contrarian on everything. Love here. it. Uh, Love <laughs> it. So rare. <laughs> What do, you, what do you? How do you feel about historical fiction in general, uh, Dennis? Do you have any thoughts on that? Is a is a, a period uh, style genre, if you want to use it, that term? I have not read a lot of historical fiction. Like, I've read some stuff that is set in historical times, but I wouldn't call historical fiction because it's not it's not attempting to be terribly historical or to really set the characters in a particular time like this one was. I have no objection to historical fiction. I just haven't read a lot of it. Yeah. It was one of the questions we put out on our uh, social media and on our Facebook page. Uh, one of our listeners Amir Pulio, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, they say that they love historical fiction. It's such a fun way to learn about the past and place yourself in history to think about how you may have reacted to events. Do you, do you guys do that at all? Like th- imagine, okay, if I was living in post-war Europe or Boston or what, or, or even wartime, like how, would, would you be, have the bravery or the, make the same decisions or, or, or do you just sort of read it like as a, as a spectator, I, I never thought of it putting myself in the shoes and and comparing my own sort of values and courage uh, in those times. I haven't thought of that way. So that was, I thought that was an interesting perspective from our listener. But what, what, have you guys done that? Yeah, I I often do, especially when I do read World War II um, historical fiction, uh, just because my family background is that, um, you know, my father was born during the war in Germany. And so I've had lots of thoughts about that and my opa who was on Crete during the war and what his involvement was and other family members. But I was struck in the book, um, Ian asking quite early on saying that if you didn't do anything to help the resistance, you were guilty. And I thought that was like, whoa, that is a lot to ask. Like, and I just thought, would I, you know, because I don't think any of my family members helped the resistance, <laughs> but because helping the resistance is a big, um, a big thing to expect of like an everyday person. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a death sentence if you're caught. Yeah. And I just, I don't know, would I have helped the resistance? I, yeah, I, you I would hope, have. I <laughs> hope I would have. <laughs> you would have been leading the resistance, Kirsten. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, it's hard. It's a hard thing to sort of contemplate. But yeah, I do. I do uh, definitely think long and hard about uh, about my own place in that history for sure. Not so much when it's like really like I don't really love historical fiction that like I'm not that interested in reading like her Roman series or sagas because that doesn't I, I think I still need to have some sort of connection to the historical fiction for me to even place myself. So in more it. recent historical fiction would be more appealing to you? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I did find myself thinking a bit about how I would be in certain circumstances described in the book because that's something that comes up like. I know during this pandemic, people have to, had to put aside a lot of their freedoms and preferences and things while we were struggling with a, a health crisis. The comparison has been made sometimes about, you know, during the war, people had to give up a lot more. And so I've, I have thought about that recently. Like if you were living in a country that was at war and you had to have so many uh, reduced opportunities and so much more danger around you, how do you respond to that? Uh, it's been stressful enough just with the pandemic and a war would be more stressful and uh, challenging. Uh, how would we deal with that? And I don't know. I, I stress fairly easily and I think I would uh, be terrified in a lot of the circumstances that people found themselves in. And I think it would be extremely hard. Uh, on the other hand, I also know people at the time were similar to how they are now. And I think if that happened to us today, we would struggle through as well. But I think it would be very, very hard. Uh, one of the things that was really driven home at the beginning of the book when uh, they were doing Nina's backstory is how traumatizing her life was. Mm -hmm. uh, like having her father literally try to drown her, mm -hmm. um, being in a place where, you know, you had to watch what you said. Otherwise, a black van might pull up and take you away describing waiting long periods of time just to be able to get at a shared apartment with a bunch of strangers, very difficult circumstances. And I, I often think that trauma is the root of a lot of problems that we deal with as a society and just seeing it just on display. And in this case, it was shown as, you know, it made Nina tough so that she could fight the war and she could hunt Nazis. But I just couldn't help but feel terrible about the trauma that she endured or the mm -hmm. character endured and that, you know, many people endured at the time, especially. Uh, so yeah, the, it did put me in mind of how I might be in those similar historical circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One part of the story I thought was interesting and worth noting too, is that the fact that the bulk of the, if you want to call it the present day story takes place after the war, uh, a time when you might not think there's a lot going on. It's being the cold war, it doesn't have the action and the sizzle of, of, of actual combat. But the interesting thing was a lot of the, the challenges, there were lots of challenges to the Nazi hunters, but one of them was this sort of general feeling of people just wanting to forget yeah. and to move on. And the idea of, oh, why are you bringing this up? Or, yeah. oh, that was years mm -hmm. ago. Or, oh, that person doesn't live here anymore. Just, and I, I couldn't help but draw parallels to our own country right yeah. now with residential schools and, and discovering Absolutely. and that tension between, oh, that's so long ago. And then, or, or no, this is something that we have to address. This is something that deeply affects us. We can't just sweep it under the carpet. And, and just like they were, even though it was painful, and hard to go back and try to bring some of these uh, people to account. We, we as a country, are also facing very similar. Uh, well, similar. I, I was drawing parallels in my own head to Absolutely. our our own crisis happening in the country and our own reckoning that we're dealing with with reconciliation. Yeah, I totally mm -hmm. agree. I, I I thought of that often as I was reading it because I was sort of surprised that the way it was described was was that they really did think, oh well, let's just forget about it, let's just move on. And I was surprised that it wasn't until the 1960s that the first person was extradited from the states back to Germany for these trials and and for this reckoning. And um, I guess I didn't really it did, didn't really know that 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 was the case. And I totally made those same parallels, Trevor. And then that also made me think, too, like, so, you know, residential schools, they some of them were happening right up until the 1990s, you know. So yeah. what were what were we doing? Those folks that knew that this was happening. What did we do? Did we say anything? Did we mm -hmm. think it was wrong? Did we bring it up with? 
politicians or the police or no, not the police because. Yeah, but, did we do the modern did, equivalent of join the resistance? Yeah, and we didn't. So yeah, so the reckoning is now. Um, yeah, and and those folks need to be um, be take responsibility, but so do we as a society. Yeah, yeah. I, w- I was struck too by a parallel uh, that's more recent: um, the January sixth insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, and how it's you know not even a year ago right it's like half a year ago and there's this huge reluctance among many circles in the u.s to investigate it even you know uh, to look at it uh, even by like congress people who were at risk of their life while it was happening and at the time were certainly interested in you know this being stopped and <laughs> but now are like oh we don't need to look into that we can we can lay back on that why wreck people's lives over something that happened a couple of months back you know <laughs> it, it's weird how that happens yeah. uh, and how it can happen so quickly, quickly and yeah. right in front of us even with plenty of historical examples yeah. about uh why maybe you should address these things mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think I misspoke a couple of minutes ago when I said that people would say, oh, it was so far in the past. But it wasn't far in the past yeah. uh, in the novel. Mm-hmm. It was just a few years in the past. And in our situation uh, with the residential schools, you're right, up till the 90s or this even more recent. So it's not something, oh, it's so long ago. It's like it is in the past, but it's like let's move forward, but without dealing with what's just happened, yeah. which is, yeah, I, I guess maybe – just human nature, but it's, it's interesting that it comes up in different contexts. Mm-hmm. But so then it was interesting because Tony, the character, Tony, um, he really wants to, and along with Jordan, they establish this repository of stories and photos and to remember. And I thought that was an interesting part. And then especially when I, you know, read that Kate Quinn's mother was a librarian, because I mean, yes, it's important to have these repositories of, of our common history. Uh, whether you remember it or not, we can't, well, yeah, we can't forget. Yeah. And I think she ends the novel, something about like the living forget, but the dead remember, which also mm-hmm. made me think about all of the, the unmarked graves being discovered at former residential schools, you know, lots of correlations with, uh, with present day. So. And what we had said before, too, like she had so many different themes coming in, you know, the treatment of women um, after the war and, um, and well, and all of this, like, what is your greatest fear and all of these different things. But I think that was probably the most profound theme that went through it, it um, about remembering and um, um, making sure that such atrocities never happen again. Although it seems like we haven't really learned from from that. They, there is that saying, you know, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, that's one of the reasons why it is important to have memorials to things that have happened, to have museums, to have uh, books written, um, to remember and to document. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But she does talk about fear a lot. What are, what are your greatest fears? <laughs> what's your What's your biggest fear? You know, one thing I liked about Nina's character was she was very big on confronting the fear, yes. right? Like Ian was afraid of heights, yeah. so she wanted to take him up in this Ferris wheel thing. Yeah. And, uh, and at the end, he goes in the plane. Um, and I related to that because for the longest time in my life, I was afraid of heights, too. Like anytime we'd go to like a tall building or something and, you know, you look over the edge. I did not look over the edge mm-hmm. uh, until I decided to go skydiving. Oh, Whoa. my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, which was uh, a coworker of mine had passed away and some of us had gone to the funeral. And one of my other coworkers, while we were there, said, hey, want to jump out of a plane? <laughs> um, so I was in that mindset thinking about mortality. And I thought, yeah, you know, I, I do. Wow. <laughs> I don't know why, but I do. Wow. And I ended up jumping out twice. Um, and I can say I am no longer afraid of heights, but I will also say that that first jump was the single most terrifying thing I've ever oh, experienced my in my life. And I now know what terror feels like because of that jump. Wow. And it turns out I'm an utterly mindless, uh, non-creative thinker who can't even follow simple instructions when I am <laughs> terrified. Um, and I imagine, and I can now imagine if I were in a war setting, like as a soldier, you know, that might be how I would react because, uh, mm. terror is incredibly debilitating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but 
I, I now I can look out things from high heights, no problem. I can walk to the edge of things. Um, so I, I encourage that for those who want to try mm. to confront their fears. You are, you are just a man full of surprises. <laughs> <laughs> I only did the two jumps though. Oh, uh, it, never, that, it didn't, that. it didn't become a hobby. <laughs> no, but you did two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Despite that thing. terror. Yeah. 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 Well, and the funny thing too is, uh, when I did the sec, I didn't realize how terrified I was until I did the second jump. The first jump, I could barely breathe steadily as the plane went up. Um, the second time I was able to breathe normally and I was actually able to take in my surroundings. And that's when I realized I had been terrified the first time. Uh, when it first happened to me, because I had no context for it, I didn't know that it was terror. <laughs> I didn't know how scared I was until I repeated it. Right, right. Huh. Yeah, yeah. It just makes me think of a quotation. I, I'm probably misquoting it because it's just on the fly, but I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt said, "Do something every day that scares you." Yeah, and or something. And I'm thinking like every day. Uh, I know that's a frequently. lot. <laughs> yeah, that no, is a lot. But, like, every day. I mean, I guess getting out of bed scares. Right. Me. Uh, but it's, I don't think that's what she's talking about. I think of it without revealing any particular fear. Uh, <laughs> I, I do try to push myself into things that make me uncomfortable and try things that I wouldn't normally, because it's very easy to get stuck into a comfort zone and a routine. So uh, my practice is probably not as good as my speech in terms of doing this, but I do try to be aware of things that would be uncomfortable and would I would benefit from doing, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Every day, come on, Eleanor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a high bar there. That yeah. really is. Yeah. I had a friend that always used to quote that and I'm like, oh my gosh, no, thank you. I can't do it. Um, but yeah, every once in a while, for sure. And to be aware yeah, but, of what, what actually scares you too. Or do you know how exhausting it would like, be to be around somebody that was trying to do something that scared them every yeah, day? Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> Well, you quit dodging into traffic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know you're afraid of water, but you, you got to get out of there. No, I'm not going to yeah. cover you with dirt. Because <laughs> that's my biggest fear. My biggest fear is like being like, I guess it must be related to claustrophobia, but yeah, being like buried alive. That So, hmm. I mean, I don't, how am I going to confront that? You know, I guess. But to be fair, I, I think you should conf I think you should confront that by putting yourself in a bed with lots of blankets on top of you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that mm -hmm. sounds great. That's my advice. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's my default mode. I was just going to say that relates to, <laughs> to the napping default. Oh, <laughs> uh, boy. That's funny. Well, I mean, this is, uh, she is definitely a super popular writer because I know almost everybody, well, everybody that, uh, responded on, um, on our Instagram was just talking about how much they, uh, they love her, her writing and her books. Christy Moore Combe said, um, amazing book, love all her books so far. And she has definitely written a lot of books. Practically Prairie said, currently halfway through it and can't get enough. I hope Practically Prairie is maybe was halfway through it for this podcast. So um, that would be great. <laughs> and Aaron uh, JL78 said, wonderful book that keeps you on your toes. Yeah, so she's got lots of fans, that's for sure. Well, thank mm -hmm. God she's a popular writer because, you know, we don't want uh, Dennis's comments here to, yeah. to scuttle her career at all. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, no. I, and I realize I am very likely much in the minority on this, uh, but that's okay. Different yeah. writing styles Absolutely. appeal to different people. Absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, if we yeah. all agreed on it, we, it would be boring and dumb. Yes. Yeah, and I won't argue that she's a bad writer. Um, because like I say, she did a lot of things very competently. It's just, she's just a bad style. person, right? She's just <laughs> not a no, good. no, Trevor, don't put words in my mouth. <laughs> it's just, I found the writing heavy handed and, uh, yeah. not appealing to what I like to read. Yeah. And, uh, fair yeah. enough. I loved yes. being introduced to these Nachthexen that the Germans called these, uh, these Soviet bombers. And, uh, I had never heard of them before, or maybe I'd maybe heard mention of them, but so it was really interesting to kind of go and do a little bit of research and, 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 uh, and I mean, the photos are so amazing of these women. I don't know. They just look so, 
they look so happy and they look so strong and they look so competent. And it did make me think back to that other book that we read about the, the divers, um, oh, in yeah, South the Korea, Island of sea women. the Island of Sea Women and, you know, these strong, powerful women who went and dove right down, um, and sort of tested all of their physical capability to fish for their island and just all of the camaraderie they had and this like real kind of I mean I'm sure probably people were talking about them being sort of witches too sort of gathered around in a circle around the fire you know in the mornings <laughs> and everything I don't know I just really um, I, I, I loved being introduced to the Nachtex and just like I loved being introduced to the uh, the sea women too yeah what, one thing that that uh, story about you know they got the name because you know on one of the dives the one of the bomber pilots said that they had heard the Germans calling them Nachtex and yeah. As they flew past. And uh, it reminded me of a story I'd heard many years ago about the 1st Canadian Division in World War II. Someone that I know told me the story about how the Germans uh, had seen a bunch of different enemy units. And they said, well, we know who the Blue Jackets are and we know who this group is, but who are the little red devils? <laughs> And uh, that became the uh, the division's uh, nickname, the Little Red Devils. And I think the, the motto that I saw in a patch even said, named by the enemy. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> there were tons of nicknames all over the yeah. place. Everybody had a nickname. <laughs> I yes. know. Well, something that well, I was wondering about was how did the Germans know that they were women pilots? Because they called them the Night Witches. They did shoot down some of them. Oh, so. okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was one little part that just kind of lingered in my head. Like, how would they know? But yes, I suppose. And I think, too, couldn't they even see them sometimes? Like, I think the way that it all went, like they were so yeah. silently kind of gliding down and then they could, you know, maybe have a, yeah, yeah. a look into the cockpit. I'm, it's different than the fighter planes now, right? Oh, was, yeah, yeah. I'm reasonably sure that when a bomber is flying and dropping bombs at you that you can't say, wait, I think she has lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> That's a woman. That's what? a lady up there. That's a lady. Hey, ladies. <laughs> hey, ladies. <laughs> ladies with bombs. Oh, right. Here, actually, that's so funny. I just opened it up to the point where it said, um, I stalled last night on the fourth run and practically scraped grass by the time the engine kicked in. It was low enough. I could hear shouts coming from the Germans as they ran for cover. What did they shout? Nachthexen before the engine drowned them out. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess if the pilot's close enough to hear what the Germans are shouting, yeah. then the the Germans mm -hmm. are close enough to see who's yeah. flying the plane. Yeah. yeah, yeah I'll yeah. go with it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it was an interesting uh, story there. I, I, I do like little uh, historical tidbits like that interspersed throughout. That was handy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, before we move on to our next segment, do uh, you have any final comments we want to make on the book? Are you going to read any other books by Kate Quinn? Not me, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say that this is uh, probably a time to read first because I think this is the first book that one of my co-workers was actually super excited that we were doing. She oh. was all like, oh, you're doing Kate Quinn? I love Kate Quinn. She's amazing. Maybe I'll listen. Oh. So, <laughs> so I think in honor of her, maybe I will read another one because okay. I did genuinely enjoy it. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if I'd be into the whole – you know, Roman, yeah, me you neither, know, yeah. people yeah. doing stuff or whatever it is. <laughs> That's a terrible description. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I will. I think I will pick up another one at some point. I enjoyed this one enough. Yeah. What about you, Kirsten? I, well, I do have um, the Alice Network. It's been on my uh, to-be-read pile for a long time. So um, I think I will. I will read it. So yeah, because like I said, it's. I think it's also... It's about spies, women spies, female spies in the Second World War. Yeah. According to what she wrote at the back of the book, that one character who talks with Ian, a woman who has a bit of a stutter, she was a character from the Alice Network. Oh, so okay. There's oh, a bit of a tie-in for you. Man, I love right. these greats. <laughs> that was probably on her checklist. Then. She's like, put Easter egg in from other books to, <laughs> to cross her up. And then oh, she's that, check that box. And that could done be. And done. That could be. Yeah. So with that, we will move on to our next segment. Can you tell me a book I would also like? Like I said, I was reading this book while I was at the cottage and I finished it. And then I was like, oh, I need to read. I need to keep reading. <laughs> so I picked up the next book. And so this is a book that you might like to read if you like 
The Huntress, but also it's just another good book to read, just even if you didn't like The Huntress. Um, this is called When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. And it also deals with sort of historical, recent historical reality. Um, and it also switches its chapters between one narrator and another. Not times, but just, yeah, the, just the narrators change. So, um, so that's, Kind of, I started reading it going, oh, well, this is actually kind of similar to The Huntress. I'll just read you the, um, just a little bit of a, a blurb. So it's, the story is told through the eyes of Sydney, who is black and grew up in what uh, was then a predominantly black uh, Brooklyn neighborhood. And then it's also told by Theo, who is her new neighbor, who is white. Uh, so when no one is watching is a mystery th- thriller that escalates quite quickly as it seeks to answer two seemingly unrelated questions. One, what is the history of Sydney's childhood neighborhood? And as she and that neighborhood face the realities of gentrification that are very literally knocking on their front doors. And two, where exactly are her former neighbors going after they leave? So it's about gentrification. It's about racial tensions as well. And at the beginning, there was this quote, which also made me think about the Huntress. Um, and this is a quote from W.E.B. Dubois from a 1935 book called Black Reconstruction. And the quote is, One is astonished in the study of history at the recurrence of the idea that evil must be forgotten distorted, skimmed over. The difficulty, of course, with this philosophy is that history loses its value as an incentive, an example. It paints perfect men and noble nations, but it does not tell the truth. So, of course, again, that also spoke to me about what we were just talking about, about reconciliation and, and residential schools and things. So, so anyway, I haven't actually finished the book. I'm heading back to the cottage on the weekend, so I no doubt will. But it's, uh, it, I got right into it. And so it's sort of a mystery thriller, too, which is kind of fun, but uh, just a little bit deeper, perhaps, than your regular mystery um, yeah, so that is When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. Sounds good. Nice. Well, my pick for a book that you may like if you also enjoyed The Huntress also is a historical fiction novel set in World War II. And when I think of historical fiction World War II novels, I think of one author in particular, Ken Follett. He's written mm. all kinds of uh, genres in different different times, but he has written a number, half a dozen or so, that take place in World War II. And the one I selected to talk about today is called Jack Dawes. And uh, what the idea behind Jack Dawes is, is just before D-Day. And of course, nobody knows exactly. The Germans don't know when it's going to happen. And the key to a successful German defense is their communication throughout Germany. So what the Allies have to do is get behind enemy lines before uh, D-Day and knock out their communication system. So uh, knock out one of the um, uh, large telephone uh, exchanges. So they put it for there's a number of reasons why they have to do it this way that Ken Follett explains in the book. But what it comes down to is they have to go with their plan B because the plan A didn't work. And their plan B is assembling a crack team. Well, maybe I'll just read this description. It says, Flick, who is the nickname of the, of the main character, Felicity, and her resistance leader husband try a direct head-on assault that goes horribly wrong, But so her world turns upside down. Her group is destroyed. Her husband is missing. Her superiors are unsure of her. Her own confidence badly shaken, and she has one last chance at the target. But the challenge, once daunting, is now near impossible. The new plan requires an all-woman team, none of them professionals, to be assembled and trained within days. Codenamed the Jackdaws, which I found out was a type of bird, they will attempt to infiltrate the exchange under the noses of the Germans, but the Germans are waiting for them now and have plans of their own. There are secrets Flick does not know, secrets within the German ranks, secrets among her hastily recruited team, secrets among those she trusts the most. And as the hours tick down to the point of no return, most daunting of all, there are secrets within herself. <gasps> so it's a great story, uh, uh, you know, page turner. Yeah, I think Dennis would hate it, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I, I recommend it to, to anyone that enjoyed the, the Huntress. So that's oh. Jack Dawes by Ken Follett. Very good. Thank you. And I might like it. <laughs> oh, you might. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like to tease. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes, just a little bit. 
Uh, I rarely read historical fiction, but because of the Nazi connection, this book did remind me of another novel I've read that I'm going to recommend. Mother Night by Kurt Vonnegut is a fictional memoir of an American, Robert W. Campbell Jr., who moved to Germany as a child and grew up to become a Nazi propagandist. It's narrated by Campbell, who is writing his memoir as he awaits trial for his war crimes. As this is a Kurt Vonnegut novel, it's a lot more complex than that, of course. For instance, there's the little fact that Campbell was working as a double agent for the Allies. Too bad his role was top secret and there's no evidence available to exonerate him. As is typical for Vonnegut, the humor is dark and the questions asked about ourselves are a little unnerving. This isn't my favorite Vonnegut novel by any stretch. It's one of his darker stories and it weighed on me a fair bit after I read it, but I think it's worth a read. The 1996 film adaptation starring Nick Nolte and John Goodman was excellent and definitely worth a watch if you can find it. Mm -hmm. Ooh, these are three excellent recommendations, I must say. (laughs) (laughs) So now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, in which we hunt down interesting information about the words and phrases that we've been obsessed with. Uh, as we're recording this uh, podcast, it's in the first week that we've entered a new phase of service for the library, which is in-person browsing and computer access. Uh, and so with any new phase, there's a bit of adjusting. And so my nerd word is more of a nerd phrase. It's flying by the seat of your pants. <laughs> and I thought, where did that term come from? And I was delighted to learn that it's an aviation term. So it ties right into uh, the theme that we were talking about a bit with the, uh, the night witches. Um, so it's a term from the early days of aviation. Now, when you think of the early days of aviation, you may think of the Wright brothers, you may think of Amelia Earhart, perhaps Charles Lindbergh, maybe uh, Howard Hughes. You might not think of somebody called Douglas Corrigan. But it was actually Douglas Corrigan's flight from the USA to Ireland that this phrase was coined. And uh, (laughs) the reason it was coined this way, it it basically just means just going without any sort of instrumentation or or assistance, just kind of making snap judgments in the moment that's flying by the seat of your pants. And this is exactly what Douglas Corrigan did, because he (laughs) he built this airplane kind of on his own. And in uh, sort of in reference to Charles Lindbergh's uh, The Spirit of St. Louis, it was called The Spirit of $69.90. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and he submitted a flight plan to fly from New York to uh, California, which was rejected because they said, there's no way you can fly in this, this rust bucket. Like, it's ridiculous. So he took off and he flew the other way and he flew across the ocean. <laughs> uh, let me just read this part, okay? Two days before he filed his report to go west, he had submitted a flight plan to fly from Brooklyn to California. He had previously had a plan for a transatlantic flight rejected, presumably on the grounds that the spirit of $69.60 was not considered up to the job. So his subsequent 28-hour, 13-minute flight ended in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, his provisions were just two chocolate bars, two boxes of fig bars, and a quart of water. Which, wow. I mean, a flight alone, that's a Ooh. recipe for disaster right there, am I right? <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and um, he claimed that his compasses weren't working. And mm-hmm. he didn't openly admit it, but he was, it was widely assumed that he had just ignored the rejection of his flight mm-hmm. plan, deliberately flown east rather than west. Um, the aviation officials took 600 words to list the regulations he broke on his flight in a telegram. And remember, in a telegram, brevity is key <laughs> because each word costs something. So they took them 600 words to say everything that went wrong. And it says, despite the extent of Corrigan's illegality, he received only a mild punishment. His pilot certificate was suspended for 14 days. He and his plane returned to New York on a ship. They weren't going to allow him to fly it back. They were arrive on August 4th, the last day of his suspension. So as soon as he got back, he could start flying again. <laughs> Um, and his return was marked with great celebration. More people attended his his Broadway ticker tape parade than attended Charles Lindbergh's parade. So it gives you an idea. Um, he was also given a parade in Chicago. Later he, later he met with Roosevelt. I'm assuming President, not Eleanor. That would have been a scary thing to do, I suppose, at the White House. He was therefore after known as Wrong Way Corrigan. And he even <laughs> starred as himself in the 1938 movie The Flying Irishman. And... Um, <laughs> so yeah the old flying expression which um wouldn't have been that old in 1938 if that's how far it goes originally said flying by the sea of your trousers mm. so maybe that phrase originally was british 
and across the Atlantic the correct way prior mm-hmm. to becoming mm-hmm. flies by and by the seat of your pants. So, like, wrong way Corrigan wow. and uh, wrong way Lockhart here, we're all flying by the seat of our pants this week. <laughs> Mm. Easier to beg forgiveness. <laughs> exactly. I, yeah. And he turned out to be a hero. He turned out to be a hero. Yeah. It worked out well for him. It worked right, out well. Right, right, right. Oh, my gosh. That's very interesting. Hmm. My nerd word is also, well, I'll bring in some aviation stuff, but mainly it's because I felt that I need to reclaim this word. And I've been saying this a lot lately, and I feel like even in this podcast, I keep saying that I need to reclaim the word witch because all these strong women, you know, have oh, historically then just been sort of written off as as witches, which is a great thing. So witch comes from the Proto-Indo-European root word, weak which relates to sorcery and religious matters. Um, or there's another uh, definition to bend or wind, but also comes from the word weed, to see or to know. These root words evolved through the medieval times, and we end up with two English wor- old English words um, that will eventually create the word witch. The Merriam-Webster definition of witch is, one, a person, especially a woman, who is credited with having usually malignant supernatural powers. Another definition is a mean or ugly old woman. Or the other definition is a charming or alluring girl or woman. So (laughs) we Hmm. mix that all together. And I think, yeah, whenever, historically, whenever a a woman was, was really strong or, or um, wise or knowledgeable or did things out of the ordinary, they were often uh, talked about as being a witch. And I remember my sister in women's studies telling me this, uh, the history about the the historical depiction of women on broomsticks, so women flying, flying through the air, and that it has its origins in uh, hallucinogenic plant uh, pharmacology. So there's things like nightshade and mandrake that witches used during the Middle Ages, and they created these brews or ointments for witchcraft and sorcery. So somewhere along the line, they figured out that these hallucinogenic compounds actually could be absorbed through sweat glands under the armpits or other places where you have mucous membranes. Other um, sweaty parts. Other areas. So, um, and this came about when in 1324, there was an investigation of the case of Lady Alice Keitler, who was the first recorded woman who was condemned for witchcraft in Ireland. And this was written about her. In rifling through the closet of the lady, they found a pipe of ointment wherewith she greased a staff upon which she ambled and galloped through thick and thin. So these sort of, you know, psychedelic experiences of flying were associated with these hallucinogenic plants that were applied to the, let's say, vulvovaginal area with a broomstick. And Mm. so these witches, these wise, knowing, alluring women would fly through the air, much like the night witches who sounded like witches on brooms with their silent glide down. Witches is my nerd word. And uh, still just wanting to keep with that explicit E rating for our uh, for our podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm so glad did. you did, Kirsten, because I have no idea how to turn it off. So every episode <laughs> we have to do something that earns us that thing, because I, I have tried turning that thing off. I don't know. It keeps appearing there. So sometimes people tune in. They're like, ooh, what's going to be explicit? Yeah. What kind of saucy thing are they going to say this week, for this month? But no, no. It's okay, just well, this time, it yes. Well, we won't, I won't admit that. I've already admitted it. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, all, it's recorded. Anyway, which... That is fascinating about the broomstick. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, So my word for this month is shoehorn. Uh, As a noun, a shoehorn describes a curved piece of wood, horn, metal, or plastic used to help put on a shoe. They're especially helpful when your shoe is a bit snug, and using a shoehorn instead of using your finger to pull back on the inside back part of your shoe helps you keep your shoe in better shape and is more comfortable for both your foot, your finger, and your back, since you don't have to stretch down quite as far. 
As a verb, it means to force to be included or admitted, or to force or compress into an insufficient space or period of time. It's also often used to describe fitting something or someone into a place where they don't naturally fit. You know, like when you describe every feminine water-related spirit you can find as a lake witch so it fits one of the themes you're trying to create in your novel. Like that. Or when you're trying to cram in yet another criticism of a book you didn't really like by referencing it in your nerd word segment. Like this. Shoehorn. Oh, nicely done. Nicely done. <laughs> Some, sometimes I'm very subtle. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this month. Thank you so much for joining us, dear readers. For next month, we're reading An Absolutely Remarkable Thing by Hank Green. The Carls Just Appeared Roaming through New York City at 3 a.m., 23-year-old April May stumbles across a giant sculpture. Delighted by its appearance and craftsmanship, like a 10-foot-tall transformer wearing a suit of samurai armor, April and her best friend Andy make a video with it which Andy uploads to YouTube. The next day, April wakes up to a viral video and a new life. Have an idea about what we should read next? Let us know. You can find all our contact info at the bottom of the page at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. You can also find all our past episodes and discussion questions there too. If you haven't already, subscribe to Time to Read on your favorite podcasting service and maybe leave us a review. Tell your book-loving friends about us too. And until next time, make sure you find... Time, Time to, to read. read. All I need is time to read. All I need is time to read. All I need is time to read. All I ever read. I say that yeah. every every month. I say that. Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> well, at least this time we had some uh, disagreement about. The I book know about, that was uh, good. Yeah, doesn't happen often enough. I know it really doesn't. Yeah.